Hey, I have got a question for you. If you need to do something for God and God wants you and places you and and says, I want you to do this, is he going to just say, there you go. I'm not going to help you at all. Or how about, oh, God will help us 50% of the time. Or even, you know, God says, oh, okay, 90-10, you know, 90% to 10%. You know, does God do that? No. And you know what? We're going to find out today because if God's expecting you to walk through certain, certain situations, to do certain things, he has a plan and he has a way to give you power and the ability to do it. And today, we're going to find out about that. Hey, it's, okay. It's your turn. It's again. It's your turn. We're playing oh. Jenga. Hello. Guess what? It's your turn. For what? Jenga. We're playing Jenga. You know, the concept. Pulling the box out. We're playing Jenga and it's her turn. Come on, Brett. like in another world like maybe they're playing on their phone or talking to the person at the table next to you or just flat out not paying attention doesn't know whose turn it is who's winning who's losing maybe not even know how the game works okay and you kind of keep telling them dude it's your turn let's get the game rolling here we're stuck you know we can't do anything until you go it's your turn right we've all been in that situation well, this is kind of where we find Jesus and his disciples in the scripture that we're going to read today. So his disciples, Jesus and his disciples, they've been following him ever since that Jesus started his ministry. They've been walking with him. They've been learning from him. They have been seeing what he did and witnessing the miracles that he was performing. So he was, they were with him everywhere that he went. And they learned from him and soaked up everything they could. But now Jesus was saying, okay, guys, the time's almost coming where it's not my turn anymore. It's your turn. 
So let's look. If in the New Testament, the book of John, we're going to chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. Here we go. It says, These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples here. And he's dropping some pretty big bombshells on the disciples right now. They don't exactly understand all of them yet, but we see in verse 4, it says, I've told you these things that when the time comes, you're going to remember that I told this to you. And oh, oh yeah, Jesus told me that this was going to happen. You know, he was telling them, my time here is short. You know, it's almost coming to a close. I've almost fulfilled every purpose that I've set out on earth to accomplish. I came here for a purpose. I came here for a reason. And there's just a few more miracles that I need to do before my ultimate mission. And we know that that mission was he was going to take on the sins of the world. He was going to take on their mistakes at that time. He was going to take on your mistakes, my mistakes, all the sins of the world. He was taking on himself because he had no sin. He'd never made mistakes before. He, he was without sin. And so he was going to take him on himself, die on the cross, resurrect on the third day, and then go away back to heaven. And that was going to help us so that we could be able to have our sins washed away. And we know that now. But at the time, the disciples weren't quite sure what was happening. So then he goes on and he says, that, um, oh yeah, they shall put you out of the synagogues. They're going to kick you out of places of worship. Yet the time is going to come. Here we go. Time is short. That whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. So he's saying, look guys, you're going to face persecution. There's going to be people that are going to come after you because you believe in me. And even worse, they're going to kill you and think that they're doing God a favor. Wow, that's the persecution that the apostles were, were looking forward to. That was going to happen to them in the near future. It was gonna face, they were going to face persecution, killings, thinking that it was God's will for them to die. Then he says, I'm not going to be with you. I, I, now I go my way to him that sent me. So I'm not going to be with you in physical form. But I am going to be with you in spiritual form. Let's read verse 7 again. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient, or it is real, real important, vital for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So he's saying, I have to go physically. My flesh, I have to go. But I'm going to send you something to be with you, the comforter. Now, comforter, I'm not, I'm not talking about that nice, cozy little blanket that sits on top of your bed and makes you all nice and toasty and warm at night. I'm not talking about that kind of comforter. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost. That Jesus was saying, I've got to go, because then I'm going to come. And I'm going to come back as the comforter when you receive the Holy Ghost, and live in your heart. That's what he is talking about in verse number 7. So, it didn't make a lot of sense to them at the time. Okay, I mean, it, it says, But these things I've told you, that when the time come, you'll remember them. So at the time, it didn't really make a lot of sense to them. You know, they were used to Jesus always being there, right? And, you know, when trouble was around them, they looked to Jesus. See what he was going to do. Jesus, how are you going to get out of, us out of this? Oh, Jesus, there's 
thousands of people here and we have no food to feed them and it's going to be a, a, a bad thing if they try to go home and, you know, they're going to die in the desert. You know, what are we going to do? we, we got to feed these people. Jesus said, don't worry. Let, let's find. And he blessed the fish and the bread and was able to feed the 5,000. Then there, there was a time that the storm, they were on the boat and the sea was crashing and all the disciples are, oh no, we're all going to die. We're going to perish. We're going to die in this boat. And they're like, Jesus, you're sleeping. You're sleeping in the bottom of this boat. How can you sleep? We're all going to die. And Jesus, peace be still. And the winds and the waves obeyed. And so they kept coming to Jesus and coming to him and saying, okay, how are you going to take care of us this time? So what were they going to do if Jesus, as he said, was to go away? What were the apostles left to do? Okay, now, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he was showing himself and appearing to his disciples off and on, and the disciples are just grasping the fact that, yes, Jesus was alive, and walking and, and speaking to them. Now, at this point, let's go to John chapter 21. Verse 1 says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, so they're by the sea, and on this wise showed himself, he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana, and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, now it's, Peter used to work with, that was his partners in fishing, and two other of his disciples. Now, Simon Peter and a lot of the disciples used to be fishermen. That was their profession. They didn't fish for pleasure. They fished for a living. When Jesus called them to come with him. Now, it says, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. So, in other words, they they went to what they knew. They went fishing. They decided, hey, let's go. Let's let's go back to our own what we're used to. And so Jesus wasn't wanting them to do that. Jesus did hadn't trained him for that. He had a different idea for them, as we know, that he wanted to give them the keys. He wanted, he gave Peter the keys, but he wanted to turn things over to them because he, as he had been trying to tell them, I am going away. Now, basically, let's put it this way. He was saying, now I'm leaving, I'm going away. Here are the keys to the kingdom. Don't wreck it. Just take these keys, just like a parent would hand the keys over to their son or daughter and say, here's the keys to the car. You be careful with it. You're responsible for that. And so Jesus gave, had given the keys or the responsibility of spreading the gospel to these disciples. He instructed them that they were to go to Jerusalem and wait. Let's look. Now, see, Jesus wasn't just going to be going away and say, here you go, because he wasn't saying, now you guys have to do this all by yourself. You have to do this with no help from me. Jesus was going to empower them. How? We'll find out. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. That was verse 7. But in verse 8 it says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. 
And when he had spoken these things, see now, Jesus was going to empower them by coming himself. He spoke earlier of the Comforter coming and helping, that he was going to go away, and he had to go away, because if he didn't, the Comforter or the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God would not be able to come and dwell inside them and, and empower them. Jesus said that the Holy Ghost, when they received the Holy Ghost, it was going to be power. Power is going to come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. And not only that, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. In, and the cloud received him out of their sight. So Jesus just rises up. And then a cloud way up high. They're just looking at Jesus. He's a little speck. And the cloud goes by. And he's gone. And he, they're just standing there looking. In amazement. Trying to grasp what is going on. Okay. And they're, while they're trying to grasp this. Let's see what verse 10 says here. It says, And while they look steadfastly toward heaven, so they're looking, not just, just staring up in the sky where Jesus was at one time. It says, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? In other words, what are you staring at? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. And so they're saying, do something. Go. He's coming. He'll, he'll be back eventually. But right now, you have, see, they had a job to do. They had a job to do. They needed to obey what Jesus was telling them. They needed to go ahead and go to Jerusalem and receive that power, that promise. See, Jesus wasn't going to leave them to do this all by themselves, but he was going to give them the power to do it. Okay, we've just heard about the transition of responsibility. The apostles, okay. We've got to we've got to take our turn. So what happened when they did take their turn? What did the apostles do? In Acts chapter 17 and verse 6, it says that they turned their world upside down. So they impacted their world as much as they possibly could. Cuz that's what Jesus did. He impacted his world. So the apostles, they decided, "All right, I'm going to take my turn, and I'm going to shoulder my responsibility, and I'm going to do what Jesus do. I'm going to impact my world. And they did just that. So, you know, they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. They spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And those around them heard them speaking in a language that they had never heard before. And the curious crowd was like, what is this? What, what what does this mean? You look Jewish, but you're not speaking Hebrew. What what what's happening? What is going on here? So Peter said, "Okay, it's my turn. I'm gonna take my turn right now." He had the keys to the kingdom, and he was going to use them. And so he took what he knew. He took what he had learned from Jesus, what he had soaked up from him, and he said, "Okay." And he stood up and he preached the very first sermon in our church's history. He told them that they needed to repent, ask Jesus to forgive them, be baptized in the name of Jesus, and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence and speaking in other tongues. What they had just experienced, he was telling them that they needed to do as well. Then he went, he went with his uh, friend John, and they went to a revival that Philip was having in Samaria. And they went and prayed people through to the Holy Ghost. And then, you know, he took off and went to the house of Cornelius. And the thing about Cornelius is Cornelius wasn't just anybody. He wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile. And so at the time, you know, there, were, there was a division. You know, these were Jews and these were Gentiles and these were God's peoples and these weren't. And 
So, but Peter went to the house of Cornelius and spoke to him, and they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. So then we understood that it's not just for Jews, but it's for everybody. It's for whosoever will. The Holy Ghost is for the Jews, the Gentiles, for you, for me. The Holy Ghost is for everyone. So Peter, he took his turn, and the kingdom was greatly, greatly impacted, and it expanded. It grew because of Peter's turn. Then we take a look at a man named Saul. Now, remember when we talked in the book of John about persecution and people killing Christians because they thought it was God's will. Well, that's exactly who Saul was. Saul was persecuting the Christians. He was going on his way to Damascus to, to, to find and persecute the Christians, to arrest them, to stone them. So that's what was, he was on his way to do when Jesus interrupted. So he was struck blind. And so Saul is standing there and can't see. And he said, who are you, Lord? So he understood this was God doing this. Who are you, Lord? And the voice came back, I am Jesus. And you know, if you ask God today, who are you? The answer is still the same. I am Jesus. So he was blind and Jesus told him that you needed to, he needed to go to the street called Straight and wait for a man named Ananias to pray for him. So that's what he did. He was still blind. He went, made his way, and sat and waited. And then God spoke to Ananias and said, all right, I've got a man that I need you to go pray for. His, his name is Saul. And Ananias is like, hold up, God. Do you know who this Saul is? Have you heard about Saul? Maybe you haven't heard of him. He's persecuting us. Are, are you sure I need to? Yes, I am sure you need to go pray for him. So Ananias followed the will of God. He followed the voice. He obeyed. Even when it didn't make a lot of sense to him, he went and he obeyed. He went and prayed for Saul. Saul was filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. His eyes were opened. We know him today as Paul. He changed his name. God changed his name. And so Paul then sat there and Ananias asked him a question. Ananias said, what are you doing? You're sitting. You're still waiting. You need to get up. You need to get baptized. You need to get busy for Jesus. So that's exactly what Paul did. So you and I, we're like Paul. The world is waiting for us to come tell them about Jesus, to tell them about our experience with the gift of the Holy Ghost, with knowing who Jesus is. The world is waiting for us. It's your turn. How are you going to use your turn? Are you going to sit there and wait? Are you going to get up and do something? Now, in the book of Acts, it's interesting because the gospel is able to spread even greater because the Roman government had just paved roads. And so the apostles were able to travel on paved roads, which made it much easier and, and quicker for them to be able to get where they needed to go so they could spread the gospel of Jesus Christ more quickly and more efficiently had they still had dirt, sand, you know, not paved roads. So what kind of resources do you have that's different from the Bible days? You have the internet. You have YouTube. You have this channel. You have resources at your fingertips that the apostles didn't have in their day. What do you think they would have done with the internet? What do you think they would have done with YouTube and their channels? They would have used them to impact the world, to turn their world upside down as much as they possibly could. So I encourage you to 12 youth, do what you can to further the kingdom of God. Use your resources wisely. Take your turn and 
impact your world, turn it upside down for Jesus Christ. So, we've learned about how that God gave Peter the power and he changed his world. It was his turn. And then it became the, the rest of the apostles. It was their turn to turn their world upside down. And then Paul turned his world upside down. And the people that received it turned their word upside down. And it spread and it spread and it spread. And it's still going on today as we speak that people are receiving the Spirit of God. Now, what about you? It's your turn. We're waiting for you. Do you need the Holy Ghost to come in your life and empower you? Do you already have the Spirit of God? You see, it's your turn to get the message out, to, to do the ministry of Jesus Christ, and to get this gospel out. It is a gospel of hope. It is a gospel of salvation. It is eternal life. We, we're not saved just to sit and say, I'm saved. I'll sit here and do just, just wait for Jesus. No, that's not what we do. We get out there. It's our turn. It's our turn to affect our generation. It's our turn to do something for Jesus. It's our turn to allow the Spirit of God to flow. You see, you don't wait. There, you can make excuses. Well, I'm shy. Well, I'm this. Well, I'm that. But you see, the Holy Ghost can empower you. Don't wait. Don't make excuses. You remember the game earlier that, you know, it's your turn. It's your turn. And when you're playing the game, and it comes to somebody, and they're sitting there just staring off into space, and you nudge them and say, hey, it's your turn. Oh, yeah, it's our turn. It is your turn to get in there, to influence this world, to turn your world, to turn your generation, to turn those people around you toward Christ and God, make an impact for Jesus Christ today, right now, in Jesus' name.
28, 19. Go ye therefore, teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So we still got a gospel to preach. Like so many before us, it's our turn now to tell the lost, the hurting, and the broken that there's a Savior waiting with open arms. Right, guys we're wrapping up today's lesson we've been talking today all about the fact that it's your it, it what is, that's right it's your turn now look 212 youth you don't have to wait until you're 30 40 50 years old you can start your turn today. That's right, today. There are things that you can start right now and start getting involved in in your local church so that you're able to turn your world upside down just like the apostles did in the book of Acts. Now, if you have a notebook for our class or maybe just a piece of paper that you want, I want you to take some time this week. Sit down, think, take some think time and pray about what are some ways that you can get involved in the kingdom of God. Some ways that you can further his, his gospel. How you can take Jesus to, to someone else. Turning your world upside down. So jot some ideas. Some things that you think that you might be interested in. Because it's never too early to start taking your turn and to showing others who Jesus is. So now I want to take just a little bit of time and I want us to pray together and ask God to help each and every one of us to turn our world upside down and to take on his word. And that's to, to, to take our turn, to take what God is doing and further his kingdom for our world. All right, so why don't you bow your heads, close your eyes, pray out loud with me. Use your words, and we'll let's pray together, all right? Jesus, we're so thankful for what you have taught us today in your word, how, God, we can look to you and how we know that it's our turn. God, how we can take the, the keys to the kingdom. Lord, how we can teach others about who you are. We can show others the plan of salvation to repent, 
be baptized and be filled with the, the Holy Ghost. And I just pray over every 212 youth today that, God, I bless them to step into their purpose in their lives. God, I bless them today to turn their worlds upside down for the kingdom of God. I pray that you would help each one, Lord, that you would give them uh, understanding and just help them to know how they can be a part of the kingdom, how they can can take those keys and how they can apply them in their own lives and into the lives of others. Jesus, we thank you for it. And we just give you glory today in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. I got a song that I